Well, hello, my name is Josh King. I am the managing member, which is a fancy way of saying I am in charge at Tinderbox Marketing. And I put together this workshop, Marketing Things Every Business Needs to Know, based on a couple of things. But the primary reason I wanted to do this is that these are the things that I am seeing businesses do and the common things that I see uh, month in, month out, year in, year out, dealing with uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, medium businesses, uh, just the common things that keep coming up as I work with businesses on their marketing and their strategies. And I wanted to share these with you in a workshop because I get asked often, you know, what are the things you see all the time or what are the trends? And, and especially with social media being such an active part of marketing, people often want to know what's, you know, what, what is the thing you should be looking at? Should I be looking at TikTok or Snapchat or whatever the latest thing tends to be? And so my answer always ends up being the same, that there are just these best practices, these things that you should do that don't change, that if you do well, it doesn't matter what platform you're using to market. These are the things that are out there. These are the things that, um, these are the things you need to be aware of so that you can be successful, whatever new trendy marketing thing comes along. So on that note, um, let's dig into some tips, some things that I uh, try to recommend throughout the workshop. So the number one is, uh, thing is um, strategy is the key. Whatever you take away from today, the biggest tip that I have for, for you is thinking about your strategy. What are you trying to accomplish and, and how are you accomplishing it? What are the steps you're gonna go through? What's the process? That is the most important part. And it's one of the things that I see people missing all the time. The next one is to start with your goals. Um, thinking about what you're trying to accomplish in terms of what, what's the end game? Are you trying to increase sales? Are you trying to increase engagement? And, and these have to be your goals. These have to be things that matter to you and your business. And starting with your goals helps you hit that target a lot easier. One of the things I hear a lot in the marketing space is I don't, is a business says, I don't feel like this is working. So they'll say, I don't feel like social media is working. And I want you to prove it anymore. There's so much data available to you and so much research that you can do to look into these things that I really want you to get away from thinking about um, your goals and looking into your goals as a way to start. And I just got a note that we're not actually streaming on Facebook. So I'm gonna pause really quick and take a look at what's going on. Uh, looks like we are. Well, on my end, it looks like it's streaming. So unfortunately, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna be able to do to fix that. Uh, okay, nope, it is now. All right, interesting. Well, good. You know, I just was telling somebody, uh, I was just talking about this with a client that I was working with. They were doing some live streaming yesterday. And I said, the one thing about doing live streaming that I've learned, this is the, I think, sixth workshop I've done uh, in a row. So I've done them every Friday at 2 p.m. And the one thing I've learned about streaming workshops and doing these workshops is that something's going to go wrong. Like you can't get it perfect. There's no such thing as perfect. Something's going to go wrong. And I've embraced that. At first, I really struggled with that. But just knowing now that like something's probably not going to go according to plan. Uh, only the very first workshop worked seamlessly. But even then, I felt like I was stumbling on my words the whole time. So just know it, it, you're not going to get it perfect and it's going to be fine and you're going to live and everybody watching is going to live. Everyone's going to be fine. All right. So we'll get back to it. So thank you for the heads up. That actually came from my, wa my wife. She's my uh, rock star behind the scenes. All right, um, so strategy is key, starting with that, starting with your goals. Uh, to summarize what I was trying to say there, it's easier to hit your target when you know what that is, right? So having goals and then and getting away from saying things like, I don't feel like it's working. I want you to be able to prove it. Having goals is the place to start where you can work backwards from and then decide if they actually are working and if things are, are going the way you think they should. And then the last one is, uh, I would love it if you ask questions. So I am, I do have, the Q&A box open. I do have uh, the chat open. So by all means, feel free to uh, use those tools. Um, 
so that you can uh, interact with me. I love taking live questions. If you're on Facebook, just know there might be a delay in me getting to your questions because I can't have Facebook open at the same time as I do my, my deck. Um, so just know that, just go along with that. So um, just uh, if you're on Zoom, you can use either the chat tool or you can use the Q&A tool. Okay. Before we get going any further, what I wanna do is get agreement on terms. And I think that uh, this helps us kind of make sure that we're using the same language throughout the rest of the workshop. So the first thing is, um, I think marketing is the, is the storytelling piece of what you do with your business. So marketing tends to be the things that um, we might have to pay to, to get, like you have to pay for a business card and a website, but they aren't guaranteeing anybody's gonna see them. So marketing is a lot of things like uh, social media falls under marketing, your website falls under marketing, um, your Google My Business, and those are some of the things that we'll talk about today. Those are all marketing. Those are all things that we use to tell our story. Your newsletter is marketing. It only becomes advertising when you're paying to get that message, that story in front of the right audience. That's why it's called ads. My kids know what ads are, right? My kids watch YouTube. They love YouTube. And they know when an ad, and they roll their eyes every time. Oh, I hate ads. Well, they understand that somebody is paying to get their, to be, to, to steal their attention. And, and so marketing, storytelling piece, advertising is when we pay for that story to get in front of the right audience. And then sales is when both of those things come to an end and then there's a transaction, right? That's when the clients use you, right? So that's the sales piece. So um, as long as we're all speaking the same terms, then this should go fairly quickly. This slide, which again, I make the decks available. So if you want the, uh, the deck, if you're already into the Zoom webinar, I'll make sure you get it. I get your email address if you register. If you want it, uh, you can either um, Facebook me your email address or you can just email me directly and, rec and request the materials. And the reason why I'm saying that is people are watching this even after they're live. So if you email me at josh at tinderbox.marketing, I'll send you a copy of the materials. Doesn't matter when you watch uh, the, this workshop. So this is another slide that just shows you what I was just talking about. All right, the reason why I've been doing these workshops the past few uh, weeks is because of something that, a story I was reminded of. And, and the story comes from the history books. And the story is that in the 1920s, Post Cereal was a category leader in the relatively new ready to eat cereal category. So ready to eat cereal as we know it now, which is cereal from a box with milk was really new in the 1920s and Post was the leader of this. But during the Great Depression, when the Great Depression started, Post cut back on their advertising budget while rival Kellogg's actually doubled their budget. They invested heavily in radio and they introduced a new cereal called Rice Krispies featuring the Snap, Crackle, and Pop. So Kellogg's during that time, they saw their profits grow by 30% even in the Great Depression. COVID-19 is creating a very intense situation. It's disrupting lives. In some cases, people are losing their lives. And it's, it's creating a situation where businesses are unsure of what the future looks like. They're unsure of what tomorrow looks like. And in some cases, some businesses I know are struggling with today. The last thing that you should do is have that knee jerk reaction where you pull back from marketing. That would be the last thing that you would do. So thinking about uh, this lesson from history is going to help us try to find ways to be successful even in spite of COVID-19. Uh, in the deck, there's uh, two links to this story, so you can look into that and get some more information. All right, so moving on, part one. Uh, the thing I see most businesses struggle with, and I would say that like, out of all the common trends that I see, it's businesses not having a plan. It's they want to be successful. They have an idea of what they want to accomplish, but they don't have a plan, whether it's written. Some of them will say, I have it in my head, but I do marketing reviews for any business that wants it. And over the years, I've collected that data. And the number of businesses that say, I don't have a plan, or I have the start of a plan, or I have a plan in my head, far outweigh those who come to me and, and uh, that I get introduced to that actually have a plan. 
So that's the first piece. And your plan has a couple of things that I want you to, now this can be a marketing plan, it can be a business plan, or it can be a social media plan, but you have to have a plan. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of a business plan and, and why I don't like the regular business plans. And I'm gonna show you kind of the key aspects of a marketing plan. And both of those things you can use to drive success on a, on a social media plan. So uh, when it comes to your uh, marketing plan or business plan, I love this quote, a goal without a plan is just a wish, right? So if you have a goal, which I'm gonna drive really hard, then you need a plan to make that goal come to reality. Otherwise, it's just a wish. And if you didn't know, and I don't know, and I'm not even attempt to say Antoine's name, but he's a French writer, poet, aristocrat, journalist, and he was a pioneering aviator, apparently. So I think the guy um, was pretty well known. So that's where that came from. Um, here's the thing about your plan. Your, your plan needs to be coordinated. So I like to say that your business has three parts running behind the scenes when it comes to driving to success. You have your marketing gear, your advertising gear, and your sales gear. All three of those things need to be spinning in the right direction. If they're not spinning in the right direction, then this model doesn't work and then you don't drive results. So everything needs to be spinning in the right direction, your marketing, your advertising, and your sales. And the way I break this down is you could have a really great marketing campaign fueled by a really big advertising budget, but if you hate doing sales or you have a bad sales team or you don't have a sales team at all or anybody doing sales for you, it doesn't matter how great those other two things are, you're never gonna get a sale, right? And now think about this, sales can be the in-person sales that we know about it or the Zoom sales as we're doing it these days, but it can also be the e-commerce on your website. If your website is clunky, not easy to use and your shopping cart is a mess, it doesn't matter how good your marketing and advertising is if people aren't able to buy from you. So just keep in mind, those things have to be turning in the right direction and in the same direction. So when it comes to one of the first kinds of plans that I see people not have is a business plan. I think a traditional business plan, which is a big, long written document, they are great at collecting dust and they're good at getting a business loan. What I don't think business plans are good at are being actionable. I think a lot of people write a business plan with good intentions but then it collects dust. So what I like is the lean canvas, which is a play on the business model canvas. And the reason why I like the business model canvas or the, the lean canvas is just because they're just a easier sort of uh, format for people to get their heads around, right? It's just a little bit easier for most people to understand. So what you have here is you have these segments and some people choose to do this on a big whiteboard or they, fill, they print it out and then they fill it in with sticky notes. And then as things change, they swap it out. And I had mine and I carried mine around with me for a really long time when I was going through a period of change from like 2017 through early 2019. My business was going through a bunch of change. I had written out a business model canvas or a lean canvas. I had it filled out in sticky notes. And as I was making improvements to my business, I was constantly changing out those sticky notes. So let's look at it this way. This is the way that we will fill this out. So you'll start with one. What are your customer segments? And this can be a part of your marketing plan too. You're, you need to know who your customer is if you're going to successfully market. So you figure out who your customers, and then they have a section here where you talk about who are the early adopters. And what they mean is who are the people who are going to be the first to sign up for your service or the first to sign up for your workshop or the first to buy your widget. Then what you have to do is you have to identify what is the problem that those customer segments are experiencing in their lives, right? Related to your product or service. So what are the top three problems? And the box there is that list your top three problems. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the customer problems. Then the next one, number three, is we're gonna look at what is the solution that you have for each problem? right? What are the solutions? Now, under the box number two, you need to think about existing alternatives to your solution, right? So if you're coming up with a widget, now I work with, I know a couple guys who do, um, they do cleaning supplies for high-end espresso machines. So there already are existing products for that. So they would go, okay, the problem is you have this high-end espresso machine. The problem is that, so you're the customer, the customer is whoever this high-end espresso machine would make sense for. The problem is these high-end espresso machines build up in calcium, they need to be cleaned, they get gross. So the problem is I need this thing to be cleaned. And the problem they identified was there was only a few options for cleaning products. So they list those existing alternatives. Then their solution is their product, right? Their solution is their product that they're gonna provide. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna hop down to revenue streams. Where are you gonna make money on this solution? 
then we jump back up to value proposition. So now that you kind of have all those in mind, you're going to think about what makes your product or service unique. What makes you unique? What makes your product unique? And it needs to be, and they suggest here, a single, clear, compelling message that states why you are different or your product is different and worth paying attention to. Number nine, what gives you a, uh, or sorry, we're not going to go to number nine. That's, that's obviously down the road. Uh, number six is the channels for distribution. How do you deliver the product to your customer? Now, if you're this uh, cleaning supply company, maybe it's your website, maybe it's Facebook. Has, um, not only can you list products on your Facebook page, but they also have Marketplace. And then you have Amazon. So you have all these places where you can retail your product. And then the seven is now that you've gotten to this point, what are the metrics that you're going to look back on to define success? Remember when I said I want to get away from feeling like things don't work and I want to prove. So this is where you're going to start outlining how are you going to know if this thing is working and you have to get beyond just sales because uh, sales isn't always an indication of success. Now it's an indication of whether or not your business is going to stay open, but a lot of things can happen that can be counted as a win but beyond sales. Did people hear about you? Do they know about you? Are you driving traffic to your website and maybe it's just not converting? Well, that's not a sales problem. That's a, that, that's a, that's a, uh, like a sales process problem. If you're converting people to your website, but they're not converting into a sale, your website, something's wrong with your website or your price point. There's lots of options to look at. So those metrics help you understand, um, what needs to be improved upon or how things are working. Your cost structure is what are your, you know, what's your pricing? What do you need to go into your pricing? What, how much does it cost to develop your product? What is your overhead? Overhead, And then your unfair advantage is what makes you, what gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace? And this isn't in order of importance. This is just how you'll go through the process of, of filling this out. So that's one version of a plan is the business plan, which I like the lean canvas, which is a play on the business model canvas. The next plan is a marketing plan. So when I talk to clients about how to build a marketing plan, I always start with their mission. What do you believe in? This comes from a TED talk from Simon Sinek and the TED talk is titled How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And Simon says that great leaders and great businesses all communicate in the same way and that they all tell you why they do what they do how they do it and what they do. He gives the exa example of Apple as the one, uh, as a company that has a really great mission statement. Apple and everything they do, they believe in challenging the status quo and thinking differently. That's their why. We believe in challenging the status quo and thinking differently. The way we do that, the way we challenge the status quo is by creating products that are beautifully designed, easy to use and user friendly. That's the how. We the way we execute our why, the way we challenge the status quo is by creating products that are beautifully designed, easy to use and user friendly. And at this point, you still have no idea what they do. So then they hit you with what? The what is we just happen to make great computers or we just happen to make great iPhones or, or cell phones or we just happen to make great over the top streaming devices, right? So that's their why, how, what? For Tinderbox, it's Tinderbox exists to serve God by serving others. We serve others by working with businesses and entrepreneurs by incorporating biblical principles into our business model. And the goal is to leave each business owner or entrepreneur in better shape than we found them. What we do is Tinderbox works with small to medium businesses and entrepreneurs on their marketing, advertising, and sales initiatives so that their businesses may succeed, right? Why, how, what? Now, here's a bonus tip. Once you have your mission statement, you have a really great opportunity to market it, right? So this is the Moscow Food Co-op, and that's their mission right there, right in their seating area, right where you can eat, and it's visible to everybody. And if you look in there, I think that they, they have these bullet points, and I would say that their mission actually lives in the bullet point four, which says bringing people together to act as a community hub. So they could say our mission, our why, the Moscow Food Co-op exists to bring people together and to act as a community hub. The way we do that is by making fresh seasonal food from scratch and providing local sustainable and organic foods and ingredients in our, right? So it's really consistent. What are we? We're a, a local food co-op, right? So I like that. So now we have our mission. This is now our marketing plan. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to work on our goals. What do we want to, what do we want to accomplish? I, I always work with clients on trying to come up with a set of three goals 
so that they can they can determine more um, more successfully where the goals are fitting in. So what are your primary marketing goals? What are your primary advertising goals? What are your primary sales goals? I also think that you should consider what are, um, oh, there we go. Okay, so what are your primary marketing goals? What are your advertising goals? What are your sales goals? And then also think about what are the overall business goals and how do these tie into one another? So your marketing goals might be based on how, like awareness. I wanna reach this many people with my message and I'm gonna support that with an advertising budget. And my sales goals are to take those, those awareness numbers, so that would be impressions or reach, I'm gonna take that data and I'm gonna to try to convert those into sales. So my goal is to reach 100,000 people, eyeballs. I wanna reach 100,000 people in a year. And I know that if I convert 10% of that, we're gonna be okay. That's our sales goal, right? So those are their marketing goals. Uh, the other thing is to have business goals. What do you need to have user revenue goals? What are your hiring goals? Do you wanna open a new factory? Do you wanna hire a new person? Do you want to, uh, grow into new markets, right? Those are those are overall business goals, but then you also have marketing, advertising, and sales goals. The other thing is to think about your backup goals. Now, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So in this workshop, and whether I do a workshop live or I do one webinar based, I always have two goals. The number one goal that I have to start is I have the, uh, it's butts and seats. I want people watching and I want people um, sitting and I want people attending, right? A attendance goals. So when I get done with this workshop, I will look at how many people logged into the Zoom and I'll look at how many people watched on Facebook. And then I kind of look at, did that meet my metric or not? And I always hope for about a dozen, right? And that's not a lot, right? I'm not, I'm not looking to get a hundred people on these. I set my goal. I want 12 to 15 people watching this. That works for me. And then my backup goal is, did people know I did it, right? Did people hear about it? So when I do a real workshop, in the, and what I mean by real workshop, an in-person workshop, I always am gauging the room. How many people are in the room? But then I'm also listening for that feedback. Did people know I was doing it, right? Did people tell me, how, or ask, how'd your workshop go? Or say things like, boy, it really seems like you're doing a lot of workshops. So my primary goal always, butts and seats, backup goal, did people know about it? So you have to think of all your goals in that way. What's our primary goal? Is it sales? What's our backup goal? The other thing to think about is what metrics matter to you. And this comes from a, a blog that Seth Godin wrote, which is in the deck. And the blog, he talks about how a friend of his wanted to launch a podcast and that his goal was to make it a top 10 podcast on iTunes, um, which is now Apple Music. And that's a great goal, but what Seth Godin says is that that's somebody else's goal. That's a really popular goal that other people have. And in order to achieve that, in order to get a top 10 podcast on iTunes, you have to sacrifice content, right? You have to make it a broad appeal that, is, uh, that reaches a lot of people that a lot of people would be interested in because that's how you're going to get into the top 10. And he says that you're sacrificing the ability to serve a targeted market or a niche conversation or have a really hyper-focused conversation. So when you think about what matter, metrics matter to you, don't borrow other goals. Don't bother, bo borrow other metrics from other people. You want them to be things that matter to you and to your business. So now we have our mission and now we have our goals. Now we have to know... Who are we trying to reach? Now, if you've done the business model canvas or the lean canvas, you should already have this laid out. But what we're talking about is creating a customer profile. And this is where I have to break down some of that marketing ter terminology and let you know that you're gonna hear some of these terms and they're all synonymous. Customer profile, target market, target audience, audience, right? These are all the same. I have some that we don't say customer, we say client. If you are in the medical field, it might be patient. Right, so just understand that those are all synonymous and we're all talking about the same thing. Who's gonna buy your stuff, right? That's what we're looking at. And so what we have to think about is what is the age? So think about 10 people who are gonna do business with you. So the next 10 people to walk through the door or the next 10 people to sign up for your webinar or the next 10 people to buy from your website. What are they, what's the most common age range? What's the most common gender? Are they married? What's their job title? Where are they located? What's their household income, children in the home, hobbies, interests, characteristics? What is all the information that you can use or that you can find about them? And when I send out a re the resources following the workshop, I'll be sure to include a couple of resources that the libraries have available. And that's the Spokane County Library District and then the City of Spokane Library. 
they have some resources that will help you narrow down some of this, but you can always start with your best guess, right? The other thing is, is if you see customers on a regular basis, so we're thinking outside of COVID-19. So like if you're a coffee stand, then your research is just who's driving through, right? And you're just taking a note. I would do it on a note sheet and just take notes uh, and do it for a week. But you're trying to learn as much as you can about your customer because what we're trying to do is create messaging that reaches them. If we have a mission statement and a set of goals, they're all about this person. Our marketing is going to reflect what these people find valuable, right? And that, so I go back to the example of the high-end espresso machines, right? And the cleaning tablets. Not everybody has a high-end espresso machine. So the first step is they have to figure out who's most likely to buy one of those or own one of those and have them in their home. And that's research that they can, they can do and they can find. And typically they're going to have a little higher income because they have the expendable income because some of these espresso machines are like thousands of dollars. You can also think about, um, you know, what's their marital status? What are the things that we know about them? What are the things we can learn about them? And you could even add a line item here where you go their average home value because they might have a higher end home, all these things that you can figure out. There's one important thing that you have to keep in mind when you're creating the profile for your customer, and that is must be willing to pay you for your product or service. And a lot of businesses miss this. They go, my client is anybody, or my customer can be anybody, but it's not, because if that high-end espresso machine cleaning tablet company took that perspective and they said, our product is for anybody, leaving out anybody with a high-end espresso machine, then they're gonna spend a lot of effort and energy and maybe dollars marketing to people who have no interest in buying their product. And then they have to go one step further. So they go, okay, okay, you're right, Josh. It's, they have to have that high-end espresso machine in their house in order to buy our product. Then the next thing is, they have to be willing to pay for your product because they care enough about their machine to clean it. And that's a different person than just somebody who owns that product. And the more that you can figure out about your customer, the better equipped you are to make marketing messaging that reaches them where they are. And I'm not talking about being manipulative or, or anything like that. I'm just saying if you're well informed about your customer, you're better able to communicate with them. So you now have your mission. You now have your goals. You now know who you're trying to reach. Now it's time to figure out what are you going to do? Right, so that's the part of the plan that I have the most fun with, and that is the marketing hub model. So in the middle is your hub, and that's the destination that your customer needs to go to in order to buy from you, right? And so you'll notice that the, the, the middle is, I say website, it could be phone call, it could be an email, it could be a physical location, right? It could be anything, but I kept it on the digital and the, and the non-in-person stuff right now because of COVID. So right now it could be a website, phone call, email, like a lot of restaurants I know that are doing curbside are doing it all by phone, right? Their website wasn't set up to do it, so they're doing it all by phone. They're making their menu available online, and then they're providing their phone number, and then you call and you order. I know some are doing it by email. You have to email your order to the grocery store. They'll put your groceries aside, and then you can go do curbside. And then in some cases, you do have, um, like my friends down at Black Label and Peace Pie, uh, they have their ordering system online. By the way, they have like the best deal in town. Uh, if you're in Spokane and you're looking for a good deal, 40 bucks gets you like a 22 inch giant pizza, New York style, and then two 32 ounce crawlers and a roll of toilet paper. Uh, we did it a couple weeks ago. It's outstanding. So your hub is the place that people need to go to be able to buy from you. The spokes are all the things that you're going to do to drive traffic to your hub, to market to your audience, to advertise to your audience. So is it uh, public speaking? Is it your website and you're gonna write a blog that then you share that blog out on your monthly newsletter and then you also post that blog on social media with the intent of driving traffic back to your website? Uh, is it public relations, you know, sending press releases? Is it just social media in general? Is it building strategic relationships and is it networking? And I wanna stop for a minute and dig in here for a second because I've been having this conversation a lot lately. My business over the last seven years has been successful because of a few things and it's like a four-legged chair, right? Or a four-legged table. The four pieces of mine are one, it's, um, it's uh, doing public speaking. So doing workshops and presentations and, and webinars is the number one thing that I can do to meet new people and to build trust and to communicate my mission and my, my, my services, 
right? So that's why I'm doing these workshops, but I'm also doing these at no cost because I want to help people because it goes back to my mission, right? My mission is to serve God by serving others. So by doing these at no cost, you can sit in these workshops and, and these webinars and get a lot of really good information. At least I hope it's really good, right? So public speaking, number one. The next thing that I do to, to market my business is I do post on social media, not as much as I would like, but I do post on social media actively. The next thing that I do is I uh, send a newsletter. I think electronic newsletters are a huge piece of a marketing strategy and should be considered. Now, keep in mind, when I started my business, I started with an email list of one, right? I had my own email address and that was it. You have to grow that over time. It's, it's from meeting people and being intentional, right? So newsletter. And then the last one that I do is strategic relationships. I build relationships with like-minded organizations that serve in the entrepreneurship, small business ecosystem in Spokane with the intention of getting referrals, but also getting platforms to do more public speaking, right? So strategic relationships, newsletter, social media, public speaking, those are like the big things for me. Doesn't mean I ignore other stuff that I do on a regular basis, but those are the big ones. And I dig in there because I, you need to spend some time figuring out what's the best way to reach your customer. And I learned that over the last seven years. It wasn't like I just launched my business and knew that those were the things that I was going to do to drive the most success. I learned them through testing, right? And what I mean by, I don't mean like A, B, fancy testing. What I mean is finding out what worked, being attentive to the data, and then weeding out what wasn't working as well as I wanted to, and then amping up what was working well, right? And if you think about the one common theme in all the things that I'm telling you that drive my business, it's relationship building. I'm all about building relationships. So building strong relationships and serving people around me is the way that I've built my business. When you're mission driven and you know who you're trying to reach and you have your goals, it makes this part of your, your plan easy to figure out, right? And it, you identify what's going to work for you and then you create a system for making sure for measuring success. All right, uh, this is about it for this part on the planning part. So any questions before we uh, move on? Again, not on Facebook, so uh, I'll, I'll double back at some point to Facebook. Okay, uh, so the next piece is you gotta track what you're doing. So I don't, I see this all the time. If, if, if the client that I work with or the, the business that I meet does have a plan or if they don't, I, I'll tell you the next thing that I see a lot of businesses not doing is tracking their data. There's so much information that there, that's out available for you to track anymore. It, it would be almost a sin not to track it. There's lots of information out there from your website to social media. You have to be tracking it. Now, I'll make this available to anybody who, who requests the information. So if you're already on the Zoom, you're gonna get it. Uh, otherwise, email me, josh at tinderbox.marketing. I'll share with you a template like this that you can use. And what I'm looking at here, and I'll walk through this template, is tracking all the digital marketing data that I can get. Now, there is an opportunity to track like traditional marketing so it, or traditional advertising. So if you're running a newspaper ad, the newspaper is going to tell you their distribution. So what you would do is you would add that into this model. If you're running a billboard, the billboard company is gonna tell you the average number of cars that drive by that billboard every day. So you can still track that data. It's not a guarantee that people saw your ad in the newspaper, it's not a guarantee that anybody read your billboard, but it helps give you that indication. Now think back to the beginning when I said that if your goal is impressions and you wanna reach 100,000 impressions by the end of the year, which is eyeballs, impressions is marketing and advertising for eyeballs, then you need to be tracking all the places where you might be reaching people. So what I do with this spreadsheet is I go through every, and actually what I'll do is let me just show it to you live in the document so that you can take a look at it. But what I do with this is I get in every week for my clients and I track this data and I track it and then I send them a report. And so the good news for you is this isn't like a complicated thing. In fact, I found the spreadsheet just on the internet. I mean, it wasn't like a magic thing that I found. I mean, that I created and it was just easy. I Googled it. Uh, so what we're talking about is, so here we go. Here's a spreadsheet. So I go in every week. So this would be uh, May, let's go to the actual calendar date. May 4th will be this Monday. And I will look at 
what did I do with Facebook? How many posts did I get? How many likes, total likes do I have? How many impressions did I get? That's eyeball. How many eyeballs? How many engagements did I get? That's clicks on my content. And then how many reviews? And then if you look at the top, what I do is I create the math so that this adds up automatically. And I look at the aggregate of the data. I look at the cumulative data. So one thing I'm trying to pay attention to when I'm tracking data for me and for my clients is the total social audience. And what I mean by that is what are the total number of people that have opted in to hear from you? That's they've subscribed to your newsletter, they've clicked like on Facebook, they follow you on Twitter, they follow you on Pinterest, right? All the places. And a lot of those are already mapped out here in this. What, you know, so here's your newsletter total list, Pinterest total followers, Twitter, right? All of that. And then um, that adds up. So I'm always looking at what's that total social audience. And I had clients who, who I've literally worked with clients this calendar year who said, we don't feel like our audience is growing fast enough. And so I went back to the data and I showed them that in a month they had grown by a hundred likes on Facebook alone. They had no idea. They weren't looking at the data, right? So that I feel like it isn't working. Isn't a conversation that we're going to have anymore because it doesn't do us any good, right? What you need to be thinking about is, can I prove my gut? Can I prove what I feel? Can I disprove what I feel? And it's okay to say, I don't think we're growing fast enough, but what you need to do is be able to prove it in the data and then decide what's fast enough, right? That's the other thing is a lot of people say to me, well, I don't feel like it's doing well enough. Well, what does well enough mean? And that's where coming back to your goals comes into play, right? And when we're talking about marketing things that every business needs to know outside of a plan or within a plan, I mean, having goals that you can look back and measure is a place to avoid that dialogue that a lot of businesses are having with themselves, which is, I don't feel like it's working. Right. And you can avoid that by proving it. So that's total social audience impressions really quick. As we give a rundown impressions is the total number of eyeballs. And I've been saying that now I, I track impressions because not everyone gives you reach. And the difference between the two is that impressions is a non unique eyeball. So the example is if I go to your website twice in that time frame, which is a week, I track every week. If I go to your website twice, I'm going to count twice. That's two impressions, but a reach is one. So the reach is unique eyeballs, impressions, non-unique eyeballs, reach unique eyeballs. The challenge with this is, is not every platform gives you reach, but they all give you impressions. So I've just found it's easy to track impressions. Now, if you're curious about how to do this in a more detailed fashion, I actually did a workshop on this not too long ago. So it was marketing metrics, what to track and why and sales. And I tracked, I went through all this, like how to do it and where to find the data. So if you're interested in that, you can go back and revisit that webinar. It's on my YouTube channel. It's also somewhere in the, in, in my Facebook page, somewhere recorded. So feel free to check in that at any time. And it gives a deep dive into this, but I will continue giving you the rundown on the, on the terms. Engagements, like I said, this clicks. So that's, did somebody click like, did they comment? Did they share it? Did they click on the link? Um, that also includes website page views. So I do track the clicks on your website as did they click around and view pages? So I'm always looking at number of eyeballs. That's a good indication that people had the potential to see it doesn't prove that they did, right? Facebook can track that you scrolled through a post, but it cannot track your eyeballs at least yet. And engagements is the actual measurable trackable piece. Can they click on it? Can't, did they click on it? Um, and then the last, the, the next, the last one that I track is your total number of online reviews. I think that's a good barometer of how well you're doing. And then what I track also is the total number of posts that's social media status updates that went out in the last week. Right? So what I'm looking now there for is a causality. What, how many posts does it take to optimize my impressions and my engagements? And you'll find that there's a magic number or at least a magic window. I had a client that between all of their social media platforms was posting like 28 times a week and they were getting a good chunk of impressions and a good chunk of engagements. But 28 times a week, if you divide that by seven, right, that's four social media sites. That's what they were doing. Four social media sites, one post a day, every day. What we found is we could back that off to five or six and still get the same return on that initial investment. So by reducing our output, by reducing the amount of effort that we're putting into social media, they were able to maintain the same level of success. That's why tracking is so important. And it's why I push on this so hard 
with clients is that you have to track the data to make these kinds of assessments and adjustments, right? If you don't make these kinds of, if you're not tracking this kind of data and you're not making these kinds of assessments, it's impossible to know what's driving success or not. So when I double back to my hyperbole filled workshop title of marketing things every business needs to know, really it can be boiled down to two basic points. You gotta have a plan and you gotta be tracking the data. Otherwise you're not gonna know what's working. You're gonna feel like you know, but you're not gonna be able to prove it, right? So gotta have a plan, gotta track your data. All right, so now back to the workshop and continuing on. The other thing that you're gonna track, now I wanna prepare you, hopefully you're all sitting, right? And you're not driving, you're watching this workshop from the safety of your home uh, or this webinar from the safety of your home. The next piece is gonna be something that a lot of you are not going to wanna do. I totally get it and I'm gonna to talk to you about that because it was something that I didn't do for the first four years of running my business. And what I'm talking about specifically is tracking your sales. Tracking your sales is not anything anybody wants to do. Tracking data is not anything anybody wants to do. The problem is, and why I'm including this in the tracking metrics, is that I'm working with businesses that are out there like me that are owner-operator, right? That means they're the practitioner. They're providing the product or service for their client, whether they're making the product or they're doing all the sourcing or whatever. But then they're also doing all the sales. And if you find yourself in that boat where you're the practitioner, where you're the one creating the product or service, but you're also running the business, then you're also the one doing the sales. And a lot of small businesses don't want to be put, I mean, I, I would say probably seven out of 10 businesses that I meet with say, I hate doing sales. And I have a part on my marketing review. If you go to my website and you fill out the marketing review, one of the questions is, who does sales for your business? And one of the answers in my questionnaire is, you check the box and the check box is, I do and I hate it. And I get that answer a lot. A lot of people don't like doing it and I get it. It's not fun. People don't wanna, be, you don't wanna feel like you're chasing people up and cold calling and doing any of that stuff, but you're doing it anyway, right? And that's why I include it in my gears because it's an important part of the marketing, right? If we don't have a good sales plan and we don't have a good sales process, then how are we gonna drive success? So back to the, actual deck, I want to talk about the sales metrics. Now I use a simple spreadsheet and there's a lot of tools out there that you can use in this spreadsheet. It's linked to in the deck. So you'll be able to look at it and you can copy it and download it for yourself. But what I'm tracking in the course of a week, week in, week out is um, one, I'm always keeping a feel for how many, how many clients do I have currently? Uh, and, uh, and I have two different kinds of clients. You can be a retainer client where you pay me every month, uh, monthly fee, and we just work together. And then I have project based clients where you pay me a project fee. And then we just work on a set of deliverables. So I'm always keeping my eye on how many clients do I have. Then the next thing that I'm looking at is, um, did I gain any clients in the course of the last week? Did I lose any clients in the course of the last week? Did I pick up any new prospects in the course of the last week? Then the green and the pink areas are areas that I actually calculate and add up. And what I'm looking at there is how many client meetings did I have? Did I meet with any clients? So you'd put in the number of meetings that you had. Did I have any prospect meetings? Did I meet with any leads or anybody who's interested in my services? You add that in there. And then did I have any non-client meetings? And I don't mean like a doctor's appointment. That's not valuable. What I mean is, did you meet with like a strategic partner or did you meet with somebody who's gonna refer somebody to you? Anything that's a business related meeting, but that maybe isn't a client based meeting. It's not directly gonna to lead to dollars, but it is indirectly gonna to lead to dollars. Then I'm tracking that too. And then what I'm tracking is, did I do any workshops and presentations? And then I, what I do is I actually have an item in there where I'll add, so today I did one workshop and then what I'll go do and is I'll track how many people actually watched it and I'll add that number in and then I'll do any networking events or anything like that. That adds all up. I add that all up. So in some weeks, all that adds up. I have like 40 activities, right? 40 things that I did that were actively trying to move the sales needle. And then I track my total number of clients. Okay. So. I have to tell a story here. My business hit a rough patch in 2017 and it's a long story and I'll, and I'll shorten it up. I had an employee, great young man, a great human, but it just wasn't a good fit and I let him go. And I decided to pull all that work that I had been having employees do for me for like two plus years, pulled all that work back in house. And for a time, my wife was helping me with some of the work. And then after a period of time, I took on almost all of it. 
And what I found after about a, a, a six to eight months of, of working on my business, so my wife Natalie's working with me and I'm, I'm primarily doing everything. And after about eight months, it just, things hadn't turned around where I wanted them to be. The business wasn't where I wanted it to be. I wasn't driving success. And I was kind of beating my head against the wall. And I realized that part of what was going on was I wasn't really holding myself accountable in the sales area. And I was holding myself accountable in marketing. I was tracking all my marketing data, but I wasn't holding myself accountable in the sales data. And I used to be using a tool, a CRM, customer relationship management tool called Insightly. And I liked Insightly and Insightly was just fine. But it was, for my level of business, I, I have about 15 clients max at any given time. So Insightly was a really robust tool that was almost more time to manage than it was worth. So I took a step back. I leaned on some of my past experience where I've done sales. Didn't love it, but I've done it. And I revisited that. And I went, what is the information that when you're working in sales that, that your boss wants to know? What's the information that your sales manager wants to know? And I put together this spreadsheet. And it was a lot more basic than this when it started, but I started it. And at the bottom, you'll notice, here's another piece, is I track my current clients. And what you'll notice in the spreadsheet is just below that, is I track my prospects. So when I started tracking this, that section for clients was about this big. It was not very big at all. And then the prospect section had like two prospects in it. It was, it was bad. And I had to come to terms with that. That was why I didn't want to do it. And that's the, bare, that's, the, that's the root of the issue for everybody. People don't want to do sales tracking is because they don't want to know how bad it is. Right? They don't want to know what the state of the business is. They want to know how, how abysmal, abysmal sales actually are. Right? They, they, it's just like we're just going to put our head in the sand and ignore it. But by holding myself accountable and tracking it, and all I did is I just tracked. I didn't change anything about how I was managing my business. I just tracked the information. And in a, the period of less than a month, I watched that client section and the prospect section. So the number of clients and the number of prospects in my pipeline, I watched it just grow and grow and double in about a month. And in, in the, at the end of three months, my business had turned around back to where I wanted it to be. And I didn't change anything. I wasn't running ads. I wasn't cold calling. I didn't change anything about those four legs of my business that I talked about. I just was paying better attention to what I was doing. And by simply paying better attention, I realized that I wasn't doing as much of the things that I normally do, and I increased it. I wasn't doing as many workshops. I wasn't doing as, as an intentional job of networking, like all those things. And by doing that and just be paying attention to it and not changing how I run my business, but just changing the activity level, I was able to increase the bottom line. And so I now track this every week. And this is the same form that I coach clients on when they don't have a sales process. So when we think about why I'm doing this workshop, marketing things every business needs to know, you got to be tracking your sales as an integrated part of your marketing strategy. Because if you're siloing the two, even if you're a massive corporation and you've got a massive marketing team and a massive sales team, if they're not talking to each other and they don't know what each other is doing, you're not gonna drive success, right? You're not gonna find the results you want because marketing isn't being held accountable to driving traffic for sales and sales isn't being held accountable to that traffic. So they, everybody needs to know what everybody's doing. And even if you're a team of one like me, if you're not tracking the sales data, it's the same thing as siloing it because you're not being accountable. I was just out there marketing, 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 but I wasn't tracking any of my sales activity, which meant I wasn't paying attention to what was working and what wasn't working. So we have to track. All right, so bonus time. Keep the questions coming, by the way. If you have questions, love to hear them, uh, wanna hear from you. I know I'm talking a mile a minute, that's just my speed. Um, and I know, I know if I was a really good public speaker, I would learn to slow down. Uh, bonus stuff, okay, here's something I see a lot, and it's basic, and it's free, and that's the good news. And the other good news is, anybody can do it. You got to claim your Google My Business profile. Claim your Google. Okay, what am I talking about? This. When you Google a business, the map listing that shows up on the right is a Google My Business profile. And you have to have that claimed. And it's free to claim. And then when you claim it, you get to edit all the information. And I just ran into this in the real world. I just, two days ago or last night, it was last night, I just went to go buy sprinkler equipment because it's that time of year. And even with all the stay at home restrictions, I have to take care of my yard. And if I don't take care of my yard, it's gonna turn yellow and it's gonna drive me nuts and I'm gonna stress out and I don't wanna do that. 
So I'm going to go buy parts. So I grabbed my mask and I went to the place and I went in and I, and I knew this business, this business is tricky because they have a locally owned, or they have a local name from the company that was started, but they've now been bought by a bigger company and the bigger company actually owns all that data, right? So the bigger company owns all the data and they manage it. But on the local level, and, and so it goes by the, that national company's name, but on the local level, everybody knows it by the local name. I don't want to let the cat out of the back because I don't want to pick on this business. So I hope you're tracking with me. But I knew this because a year ago, I spent four trips to this business on a Saturday and I learned the hard way how to figure out what website to go to, how to find their hours, how to contact them, right? So I went into this business last night. I knew the story and the guy ends up telling me, the guy running their counter, that they run into this all the time that people don't know when they're open and they don't know what days they're open. And the hours on Google are different than their actual operating hours because they've adjusted their operating hours because of COVID-19, right? This is low hanging fruit stuff. And he was like, we're not in control of that Google thing. And I guess we should be. And I'm going, yeah, you should be because it's free. It doesn't cost them anything. And if you're the national conglomerate, if you're that national organization that owns this business, then you should be releasing control to the individual branches so that they can control this data. This is free. And it's directly tied to how people do stuff. They pull up their phone, they put in the address of what they want to go or the business they want to go to, they hit call or they hit directions. And if that information isn't correct, you're just, you're, you're losing business. Right? Sorry, I got really passionate there and I ignored a question. So how long does verification usually take? I set up a profile for a client and it still hasn't gone live yet. Okay, they're gonna do this in one of two ways. They're either gonna call you and that number is based on what number is on your default profile and Google does it and don't ask me how they do it. It's super big brothery, but a lot of businesses will already have this profile. You just have to go through the steps to claim it. And if they claim it, they're gonna to wanna to call the number that's there. That's my number. So they're gonna call that number and they're gonna give you a pin over the phone. Or what you can do is you can say, hey, mail me a postcard and then they'll mail you a postcard. And by they, I mean Google. And then you put that PIN number in. Once you put that verification code in, verification should be instantaneous. And I say that under normal circumstances, but right now we're not under normal circumstances. So I wanna show you this live because this is such a good question that we need to address. So looking live, let's talk about this. Okay, here's your Google, right? So we're gonna Google, uh, so I'm gonna just log into mine. So here under your Google tiles, here's your business. And oop, I need to switch accounts, standby. Okay, here's my business. Okay, there's this line here, stay connected during COVID-19. But if I go to my insights, or sorry, my info, there's gonna be another warning. And the warning, oh, it's not there. Well, the warning was, and it might not be on all accounts, but the warning that I have been seeing all over this area, which is how you manage it, is that Google and their staff are currently working remotely and um, following stay at home orders, and that your information may not be changed right away because the review process is really slow. So while under normal circumstances, you might see an immediate change and you might see an immediate verification process once you get that code, you might not see it actually go through in a timely fashion because of their processes and how they're being affected by COVID-19. So I'm gonna test this right now. We're gonna say, I also do business in Colfax, Washington, and we're gonna hit apply. And I hope, I'm really hoping, fingers crossed that I get this error to show up. Uh, it says it's under review. Nope, I'm not seeing it. So it's possible that they've changed, that they've removed that. So my guess is if you haven't seen verification come through yet, I would go through the process to re-verify whether that means you have to send the postcard again or get the phone call again. But that process, that verification process should be instantaneous. So I hope that answered your question. That's a great question. So I wanna go back and show you this live again. Um, because it's, it's, a, it's an important thing. So why am I claiming this? So there's a couple of reasons why um, you wanna claim this. The first one is um, this is directly tied ooh, to your map listing. So if you have a business that people need to vi visit in person, like a physical location, then you need to have this claimed. Um, the other reason is that it's directly tied to Google search. 
So when you search my business, this map listing shows up. And if it's directly tied to Google search, isn't that something that we would want to claim? The other thing is, is that it's review driven, right? So online reviews are going to happen. And I always say that they're going to happen whether you know they do and or not. And I actually was working with a client that wanted to turn off all their review websites. And I was like, I mean, you can, but then people are just going to go somewhere else to write the negative review, right? You can't, you can't control what negative things people have to say about you. So um, we want to be aware of where the reviews are coming as a part of our business. We want to be connected to Google search because they kind of own the search game. But then here's the other reason you can actually post to this, like a social media site. So here is the business brew that's being hosted next week. So if you're not familiar with it, business brew used to be an in-person, um, I don't call it a networking event, but it was an in-person uh, event where we would bring in uh, outside speakers, uh, guests to come in. We have an informal conversation with them around coffee and ask questions based on their subject matter expertise. Uh, so some examples are we brought in a, a profit coach who knows how to help businesses become more profitable. profitable. We've brought in experts on harassment and bullying in the workplace, uh, people who are experts in tax, people who are in, uh, experts in healthcare. And so I've decided to do this again by, uh, by webinar. So here's a post, right? This is right on my Google page. So if somebody Google searches me and they find my business for the first time, this post is right there. And here's, here's the workshop from, t uh, oops, I didn't post my own workshop. <gasps> I'm my own worst customer. Don't tell anybody. So you can post directly to it. You can manage your information as people find it on search. It's directly tied to Google and you can gab, grab reviews. That's why I think that this is such an important tool and why I mention it in the bonus. Okay, good question. I hope I answered it. So let me know if I didn't answer it and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go back and try to answer that uh, more completely. All right, so the next thing, um, next uh, bonus, clean up your digital footprint. What I mean by that is that anything, any information that lives on the internet that is in relation to your business, you need to be in 100% control of. You need to be sure that it's what you want it to say. You need to be sure that it's accurate and you need to be sure that it's up to date. So here are some things that we're talking about when it comes to your digital footprint. Number one is your website. You should set a process to go through and review the content on your website every six months, every year, whatever it is, but at least every year. You need to go through and make sure your employees are the right employees. I've worked with business after business that has a list of their employees online and their pictures, but then half the employees aren't there, right? Like you have to keep that up to date. Um, your contact information, you got to look at your about, make sure you're managing your blog on a regular basis. Your website is a part of that digital footprint, that footprint that lives online when people search your business or try to find your business in the digital space. Facebook's a big one. Now, when it comes to your digital footprint, I make the argument that this is a lot like building a house. And in order to build a house, you have to have a good foundation. The thing about a foundation is if you think about it, you don't always see the foundation of a house, right? What you see is all the pretty stuff. You see all, you see the roof and you see the siding and you see the garage door and windows, right? In the social media space, it's the same thing. On Facebook, behind the scenes, you get a lot of information that you need to fill out. Your address, your phone number, your website, your email address, your mission, your description, your products, your services. And a lot of businesses don't fill it out. And you're missing a huge opportunity to build a really good foundation, which means that people can find you. And in some cases, people who don't know who you are. So you have to take the opportunity, build a good, found, build a good house, right? Build a good marketing profile or, and a good marketing footprint by taking care of the foundation. So Facebook is a big one. That Google My Business we were talking about, a huge one. You, here's the thing, I want, you to, I want to challenge you to do something. Pull out your phone, go to Google Maps. If you know that you have a Google My Business profile, search your own business and see how much information actually shows up on a phone. If you're not in that space, here's what I would do. Pick your favorite restaurant and look it up on Google Maps and find out how much content is actually on there. It's, um, it's unbelievable right? Google My Business has a lot of opportunities to put information in there and you should take advantage of that. Uh, LinkedIn, you have a company page. LinkedIn, you have a personal page. Clean those both up. Those got to be right. Got to have all your graphics in the right spots, your profile pictures, your cover photos, right? Every one of these has those. Your website, got to have good images, got to have good graphics. Is it your right logo, right? We're taking a look at all that. What's your about information? Is it up to date? What's your company history? Electronic newsletters, good opportunity to have good content. Every footer of a newsletter, if you send it through MailChimp, Constant Contact, or whatever, is going to have your contact information and your social media links. Got to make sure that's all accurate. Is your Pinterest profile up to date? Is your TripAdvisor of your travel company, is that up to date and claimed? 
Uh, Twitter, that's a big one, right? And here's the thing about Twitter and even Instagram, you only get 160 characters, but that should be jam packed full of information about your business. Uh, your Yelp profile, even if you don't have a single Yelp review, if there's a profile there, it's free to claim. I recommend you claim it, get it up to date, clean it up, do it. I was working with a client and they, uh, so Bernardo Wills is probably, Bernardo Wills Architects is one of my uh, shining students. They're a great example of how to get things right. They have a glass door profile for the uh, occasions that they list jobs. And we went through and cleaned that up because it was out there and people could find it. So we tidied that up. We fixed everything right don't ignore anything fix it all it's got to be tidy and then set a schedule to go back and review it right i see businesses missing this all the time all right here's the like the i think it's the last one nope second to last your website's got to be mobile friendly and i'm not even going to go online and bother showing this and i want to give you some 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 like language terminology stuff to be uh, aware of here anymore websites do not have two different versions it used to be you had two different versions of your website you had your regular website then you had your mobile site and then what happened was is your 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 um the the mobile device communicated with your website and then told your website that or that you were on a mobile device and then your website gave them a different version right that was the old-fashioned way anymore they're called scalable sites and what that means is that your website is designed to shrink or expand based on the browser and the size, right? So the way to test this is to pull your website up on your browser and then drag your browser and make it smaller and make sure the website compacts with it. The other thing is you gotta go to your website. So I had a client that will remain nameless, one of my favorite clients of all times, but as we were digging into the data, right? Digging into the data, tracking the metrics, looking at it, something they hadn't done, and as I started doing it for them, guess what we found out? we found out that over half their traffic to their website was coming from a mobile device. And then we went to their website and their website wasn't mobile friendly. Got to do it. And based on that, they paid for a brand new website. You have to have a site that serves the needs of the people visiting it. And if people are coming on a tablet or a mobile device, then you need to make sure that you have that. Your website fits that, right? Got to do it. So I don't have to spend a ton of time on that. Uh, the last thing is we're going to revisit goals here because this is the last piece that I want you to be aware of. So when I think, when you think about your goals and you think about measuring goals, right? We had your, what are your primary goals? What are your backup goals? What metrics are you tracking? And then here's the thing, got to be aware of what you aren't measuring. And there's a couple things here. You're not measuring in this social impact. You're not measuring the impact of on your community. You're not measuring how people feel. You're not measuring how your clients feel. It's not a customer survey. You're not measuring how your, your employees feel. That's information you should track, but the information that we have talked about today doesn't cover that, right? So we're not measuring that. And those are key indicators of how well your business is doing. And then there's another piece that we need to be talking about when we're talking about goals and when we're talking about measuring, which is anecdotal evidence. You have to track the anecdotal evidence. What do I mean by that? Well, it's super simple. Here's what I mean. What I mean is that um, you're, if you're doing this stuff and you're doing it well and you are tracking your data and you're marketing and you have a message out there, you're going to be able to track the impressions. You're going to be able to track the engagements. But one of the things that you're not tracking in addition to social impact and all that stuff is you're not tracking how, uh, what people are telling you. I call it anecdotal evidence. You're not tracking the times that people tell you, hey, I heard you were doing a workshop, how'd it go? And I've mentioned that multiple times that my primary goal is butts and seats. I can track that, right? What I can't track or I should be tracking, but it's not the same, it's not as official, it's more junk science-y, is how many times throughout the week or the month or the year people are talking about my activity. I saw you did that workshop. How did it go? Oh, I heard you were doing this workshop. I planned to be there, but they didn't show. But guess what? They heard about it. That still counts. I have a client that this happened to. So it's again, it's Bernardo Wills Architects. It's one of my shining examples of a client. I may have said Bernardo Wills Associates earlier and I didn't mean to. Bernardo Wills Architects. And this happened to them as we got their newsletter going, we're making tweaks to their website. We were posting on social media. We were cleaning up all their marketing. We were just they started people coming out of the woodwork saying, oh my gosh, you, you're so busy. You have so much going on. The reality was they weren't any busier than they had been before. They were just doing a better job of communicating with their market. And the impact of that was 
people were hearing about it, people were seeing it, and people were telling them about it. That's the anecdotal evidence that you have to be paying attention to. And I see a lot of businesses not paying attention to it. I've spent this whole time though talking about how I don't want you to say, well, I feel this or I think that. But this is one of those feeling things. Like you need to be getting a finger on the pulse of what people are telling you. And it's an informal piece of all of this. But it's as important because if people are telling you routinely that they're hearing about it and they keep seeing your stuff and they keep hearing about you, that's important information to be logging away, even if you're just tracking it in your head. Now, what you could do is you could add a line item to that spreadsheet and you could be tracking throughout the week how many times people told you it. But I just know over time, it's just a feeling that adds up. I know there are times when it feels like people are saying that more than there are times when it feels like they're not saying that. So I try to pay attention to that and I try to track that, you know, in my head and make sure that I'm aware of it. All right. On that note, we're rounding this thing up. I always mark these up for an hour and a half and I usually save the last half hour for questions. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them from you. Uh, in the meantime, um, if you want to contact me at any time, feel free to, you can email me, Josh at tinderbox.marketing. You can head to my website, tinderbox.marketing, www.tinderbox.marketing. I am on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I am on LinkedIn, but I put those two because I'm a little bit more active there. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, you certainly can. And uh, feel free to reach out at any time. I'll make the, the materials available. So on that note, I'll take any questions that you have. And before I do that, uh, you, you can uh, request a free marketing review by heading to my website. You can do it at any time. You have nothing to lose. Uh, I've done it for people that um, didn't have any intention of hiring me multiple times. I love doing it. It's one of my favorite things to do. It helps me provide you with feedback on what you're doing to market your business and how well all of that's doing. So on that note, if you want to contact me, here's that information again. And I'll take any questions or comments that you have. And I'll just hang out here for a few moments and let that happen. Still taking questions if anybody has them. Haven't seen any come in yet, which is totally cool. It just means I did my job and covered really good content and left no loose ends except for the one. All right, well, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I will continue doing these workshops as long as we are working from home, that's my plan. I'm still looking for feedback on uh, topics you'd like me to cover. So if you have any ideas, suggestions, recommendations, based on today's conversation, I think I'm gonna aim a workshop next week on sales, uh, but I'm open to suggestions uh, and, and um, any recommendations that you might have. So please join me. I'm trying to do them Thursdays at 2 p.m., but stay tuned. I appreciate your time. I know the time is valuable and I always am so thankful when people show up. I appreciate it and keep the questions coming. And if you have any questions, email me, josh at tinderbox.marketing at any time. Thank you so much.